you know, we tend to think that the internet has cored out traditional media businesses like video and, and music. Uh, that's a habit of mine that we've got. But many folks are unaware that also the console game industry has been going through traumatic changes as well. Uh, they were as unprepared for the advent of the web, the two-way web, as any other companies. And so the traditional console companies have been struggling to figure out exactly what to do with the social media and the social web. And what's occurred in the meantime is, of course, a host of innovative companies have popped up uh, from across the spectrum. And we've got a couple of them with us today to tell us a little bit about social gaming and the gamification of everything. Uh, of course, as the web uh, starts to penetrate everything, it starts to permeate everything, that two-way dynamic that enables people to have a meaningful role in the outcome of what they're doing, in the outcome of the media they're watching or entertain the entertainment they're consuming or really any other type of experience, well, that creates the conditions that are perfect for a kind of game, but it's a rather new kind of game experience. So just in the last 18 months, this term social gaming has really started to ca capture the attention of major media companies. And today we've got two great companies visiting us who have got solutions that support media companies. They're designed to support media companies in their efforts to gamify, to extend gameplay into traditional media experiences. So with me today are Kevin Slavin from, um, I'm sorry, uh, your new company? Starling, which is really social TV is what you're focused on, is that right? And, and Volker Hirsch, who is with Scoreloop, uh, which is about putting social games on mobile phones. And I thought it'd be useful to orient you to the companies to start out with presentations. So Kevin, why don't you give us an overview of Starling to start with? And you can stand at the podium if you like. Okay, I, uh, okay. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Uh, you can use the podium if it's easier. I think it would be. Uh, uh, there's apparently uh, less than 10 minutes, so uh, uh, I'll have to do this very quickly. Uh, but Starling uh, is a second screen uh, platform, uh, cuts across uh, uh, whatever it is that people are using these days. Um, and it's basically around the uh, consolidating the conversations that are happening around uh, uh, broadcast television uh, and figuring out what is it that motivates uh, the kinds of engagement around that. Um, when, um, when I was originally sort of asked to think about what was going on here, I thought uh, it would be useful to just examine the overall trend of gamification um, uh, and sort of where that comes from. And so I'm going to have to skip over a bunch of stuff, but just to give you a little context, you know, this is sort of um, uh, uh, the, the original, um, where I come from, uh, previous to Starling, is a company called Area Code, uh, which has started six years ago. Uh, and that itself came out of a new type of uh, uh, interaction with the world that starts with something called geocaching um, uh, in the year 2000, so this is 11 years ago. The idea that the world itself could start to acquire uh, points. Uh, how many people know what geocaching is? Usually a lot, but not everybody here. Okay. All right. It's basically the idea that uh, as this is a game that has about 5 million people playing it. It's been going on for about 11 years. Uh, people are hiding. Uh, things in the world for other people to discover. Uh, and it changes the fundamental ways that people are interacting with the world. And I remember seeing that in the year 2000 and thinking, oh, well, that changes a lot. And this is some work that Frank Lance was doing in 2003. And so it led to uh, some interesting uh, stuff out of NYU where uh, I've taught uh, uh, in so-called big games. Um, and these are games that use the city itself uh, and change the ways that uh, people move through the city. Um, so we started a company called Area Code, which was two guys and a plate of meatballs. Uh, in, uh, that's six years ago. Went through some changes. Uh, and one of the things that's interesting, uh, relevant uh, to all of this, is, is that what you see over in the far right uh, as the, we are growing the company uh, uh, is the guy who would eventually uh, become uh, uh, the new king of social media, right? Is the guy who uh, uh, is Dennis, uh, who you know, was sort of taking what he had learned, uh, what we were all sort of working on together, about the ways that game dynamics affect human behavior and bringing that to locative media. Um, it's worthwhile noting uh, that that's the same guy who was back in the <laughs> back in Hatton, uh, costume a few years earlier. Um, and it's all to say uh, that uh, uh, this all happens in a couple rooms uh, uh, in New York City, uh, among other places, uh, the idea that, that games could start to affect uh, things outside of uh, of the game world. Um, and so uh, uh, we ended up selling the, the company Area Code to Zynga. It became Zynga New York about uh, two months ago. Uh, so uh, that's where that went. Um, and 
somewhere in there, starting about 18 months ago, came this word gamification. Um, uh, we didn't invent the word. We don't really support the word. I don't like the word. Um, I don't advise that anyone use it. Um, and that's part of what uh, I want to talk about um, very quickly. Um, so first of all, I'm not a game designer. I work a lot with a lot of game designers for a long time now, but I'm not one. Um, and what I want to say is, is that what we were doing before the word gamification came around was making games. And that's what we'll be doing when that term is gone. <laughs> all right. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about the role of game designers, um, uh, why it's contemptible, uh, uh, this gamification trend. But there is something that's really, really important that's in there. There are a couple things that are really, really important in there, and let's talk about that. This is a game that we did in 2008 called Parking Wars. We did this for A&E television. This was, to, this was to promote a show on television um, uh, called Parking Wars. Uh, we built it. This was one of the first games on the Facebook API. Uh, this quickly became, uh, at that time in 2008, the single most successful branded application uh, on Facebook. Um, the numbers were kind of crazy. Uh, we started to we started melting servers. After a year, uh, this was a very interesting thing that we saw. Right, is, is that the show itself uh, had 1.04 million viewers. Um, the game, in the end, at the end of 2008, had about 1.8 million players. Right, so there were there were like basically one and a half times as many players of the game of this little game that we made than there were of the show that it was supporting. Right. Um, people spent twice as much time playing the game than they ever did watching the show that it was promoting. And most notably, whereas A&E whereas &E in that year served 96 million pages of, of video content, everything else they were serving, we served 1.3 billion pages uh, uh, within the game. And we thought, okay, so in 2008, like, there's something really, really important here about the difference between the way people engage with conventional media as opposed to the way that they engage with games. Um, and so we went to A&E we and, &E and we said, this, wouldn't it be great? Let's turn this into something, especially because over in China, they had already taken the code and had turned it into a game called Parking War, uh, which generates, as of today, about $7 million a month. Uh, it has also spawned uh, the Great Indian Parking Wars game. I don't know what numbers that's doing. Um, the point being that uh, uh, what happens with games that's so different from conventional media is, is that whatever it is that you're watching, whether it's Battlestar Galactica or what have you, it's going to be, arguably, less valuable tomorrow. And less valuable, the tenth time you watch that episode is going to be a lot less interesting than the first time you watched it, right? But when you play chess, the tenth time you play chess is way more interesting than the first time you played chess. When you play the hundredth time, it's way more interesting than that first time. There's something that's really, really different about the way that games work because they become more valuable over time, in part because they become more demanding. Right? And this is a really important thing. It has nothing to do with gamification, but it does have to do with games. It has to do with the way that the human mind works. Um, so uh, I'll skip over a bunch of stuff, the role of game designers. Okay, here's the, here's the problems with gamification, right? and I'll skip over some of these. One of them, the first one is, is that, uh, and these are different people who uh, I want to make clear to give credit to them in their critiques. Um, first one is uh, Sebastian Vetterding, who says, one of, the, one of the assumptions that gets made is, is that uh, games make things fun because games make things fun. And the fact is, is that most games aren't even fun, right? That most games that are, that are designed by like most professional game designers are awful, right? 90% of them you'll never even have heard of. 95% of them will never make a profit, probably higher than that. So it's not as simple as just saying, if you add a game to it, it will be fun because if that was true, all games would be fun in the first place which they're not. Right? The second critique is something called pointsification, right? That when we're talking about gamification, what we're really talking about is pointsification, right? And this is Margaret Robertson's critique. And, and she says that when, you know, what happens when Nike Plus is often given as the example, right? The idea that uh, I get points for uh, uh, the number of miles that I've run, I get points for checking in to the room, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that what, what that's doing is it's taking the part of the game that is arguably the least important part, which is really just the feedback on what it is you've been doing in the game, and it mistakes that for what you were doing in the game, right? That what you're doing in a game is making a bunch of really, really important decisions, and you're, and you're dealing with sort of the consequences of those decisions, whether that's chess or tennis or World of Warcraft, right? What you're doing is making decisions, and what the points reflect are the decisions that you've made. So when points are just sort of smeared on top of experiences, that's not a game. That's just points. Right? 
Um, the third thing I'll skip. Uh, the fourth thing I'll skip. Uh, uh, and uh, the fifth thing I'll skip. Uh, the sixth thing is sort of important. Um, and that's the so-called magic circle. And the magic circle comes from a 19th century philosopher, Johann Huizinga, who talked about what we're doing when we're playing games, which is that we sort of step into a kind of magical space. And in that magical space, we say, what we do here, those things don't matter, right? It's fun to bankrupt you in Monopoly because it doesn't bankrupt you in real life, right? That's what makes it fun, right? And that what games do is they set up this weird space where you and I are gonna have this weird conversation where all kind of conventional physics, whether they're moral or physical or what have you, are suspended, right? And the moment that you start to actually clamp those onto real things, like frequent flyer airline miles, something weird and tweaky starts to happen to the motivations that are involved. Right? So these are some of the critiques. Um, then there's the counter critique that says that all of us who critique that are just old white guys who are afraid, uh, which comes from Gabe Zickerman. Um, so, so that's sort of the critique, that's the assertion, the critique, the counter critique. But putting away all of that, there's three important things that I learned from working with game designers closely over the years. And, and, and they sort of, I'm gonna use this to hinge off of this and then I'll, then I'm, I'll be done here. Um, uh, this is an observation by a, a really interesting uh, doctor and uh, healthcare uh, thinker named Jay Parkinson. And it was about a study that was released uh, that was tracking people's data carefully. And what it reveals is, is that basically, if you track all of your data, like where is your cell phone, what calls do you make, who do you talk to, what text messages do you send, mostly, most everybody has mostly really boring lives, right? <laughs> And that it's, that in fact our lives are super predictable, right? And I think that games and, and, the, and the things that are underneath gamification are speaking to three things that are real, that, that, that are in a way, we're looking for antidotes for this basic idea, right? Um, the first one is we're looking for a model of the role of luck. Um, I've been playing a game uh, uh, called Quadradius. It's not a super interesting game, but I've been playing it a lot. And one of the things that, that it has in it is it's a game in which you can be extremely lucky, right? And the idea within games, um, uh, uh, I see this uh, with my bank now. They say that one out of every thousand deposits that come in, they will double, right? And it's basically like a slot machine uh, uh, for my deposits, as if I would deposit more checks. I'm not sure what the motivation is there. Um, uh, but the idea like, okay, this thing that we don't really want to acknowledge about real life, which is that luck plays this really important role, is actually modeled in games. And we get to actually kind of explore this thing, that you can just get better cards, right? You can just have a higher throw, what, what have you, right? That, that luck gets to play out in games in a way that's satisfying, in a way that it's not always so satisfying in real life. The second thing is, is that there's a dream of meritocracy that everybody's sold that doesn't necessarily play out. Right? If you think about wherever it is you work or wherever you went to school, the idea that the best one wins is not necessarily the case. That is kind of true with chess. Right? It is kind of true with the world of Warcraft. Right? And you will, if you work hard at it, you will advance. Right? And that is a fundamentally, it, and it's true about Foursquare, it's true about anything that's really well designed with game mechanics in it, is, is that if you work hard, you will advance. And that is satisfying in some fundamental way. And the third thing, uh, and this is the last thing, is that um, uh, the value of overt constraints, right? So it's true that our lives are pretty predictable, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but um, it's also, you see this in chess, you see this in parking wars, uh, uh, or any, again, any game. In fact, the value of games comes not from allowing you to do anything you want. The value of games is in setting up rules that prevent you from doing almost anything at all, right? that chess wouldn't be more fun with fewer rules, right? Foursquare wouldn't be cooler if you could do a million other things besides checking in, right? That, that in fact, uh, uh, the expressiveness within human communication, the desire uh, uh, is to actually find boundaries, right? To find those edges uh, in which to do something that is actually meaningful. And that the more edges on those you put on, that what game designers are really doing is just putting a bunch of edges onto your behavior so that whatever you can find to do in there becomes increasingly meaningful to yourself. 
And, you know, so that's, that's really, you know, those three things. It's, you know, like relative to gamification, if you're not novelizing or cinemifying or musicifying your business or your project, don't gamify it. It's not, it's not a butter uh, to put on bread. Um, but if you spend a lot of time with game designers and related professionals, you can learn a lot that will help you understand what delights the human species. And that's a lot of the stuff that's inside games. So, thanks. Yeah, just go ahead. Yeah, please. Do I just click, guys? Oh. Okay. Um, well, Kevin is, is, is uh, uh, quite obviously quite a bit smarter than I. Um, uh, you will see that I uh, um, uh, will take a much more simplified approach to this. Um, here we are, gamify. I was actually looking for an even wackier term, but I couldn't find one. <laughs> um, because yes, he's, I absolutely agree with him on that. It's it's uh, uh, it's a it's a bit of a, a bit of a weird weird buzzword. Um, one slide on my background. Um, this is the guys I'm working with. Um, uh, I'm their their I'm their strategy guy there. Um, we're the leading um, social gaming platform across mobile devices. Uh, we're growing by um, uh, a million. Well, last week it was a million uh, and a quarter um, new users per week. Um, uh, available on, on the iPhone, on Android, on BADA, on Windows Phone, um, uh, uh, etc. Et and we're working with um, um, a, a lot of the uh, big boys when it comes to connected TVs to actually create um, a multi-screen experience that actually extends to that. Um, now, <coughs> I think the, the ultimate question here has always been, you know, how do you direct consumers to your offer? Right? If, you, if you can direct them to your offering, um, uh, uh, you don't grab eyeballs, engagement, whatever you want to call it, um, uh, uh, you don't build a relationship and you will ultimately not get access to whichever wallet you um, uh, uh, need to get access to. Um, so the traditional way has been through coercion. Um, uh, uh, and you can do this in, in um, uh, fairly blunt ways um, uh, by you know, basically uh, threatening punishment um, and there's also slightly more elegant ways to do it. Um, if anyone knows this gentleman, he is the uh, founder of modern Turkey, Kemal Atatürk, and um, <coughs> he um, uh, wanted to build a secular country um, in Turkey. So um, he wanted to get rid of uh, the veil. Now, how, how did he do that? Um, and this is anecdotally, and by the way, this could also apply to Catholic crosses. Um, now, anecdotally, what he did is not prohibit people to wear the veil, but he ordered that prostitutes had to wear a veil. <coughs> and very, very quickly, uh, no one was wearing a, uh, a veil. Now, guys? It doesn't work. Can you try and advance it? Okay, so basically, if in the blunt way, um, litter and you die, or in the slightly more elegant way of, uh, uh, of Mr. Atatürk, it's the stick approach, right? You threaten. Um, now, <clears throat> on the other hand, if this girl comes, that room cleans up itself. Immediately, <laughs> right? Um, equally, slightly more elegant. Um, this is a staircase in a, uh, in a subway in Stockholm. It's been a, a project which I think was commissioned by Volkswagen, of all people. What they did is they put um, a, a piano keyboard on a staircase. And um, uh, not only uh, did, they, did they make it look like it, it also sounds like it. Because there are sensors underneath, so if you walk across it, it actually plays like a piano keyboard. Now you can see this escalator in front of it. And what people normally do when they come out of the, out of, out of the, uh, uh, out of the subway, they go into the escalator and go up. And we all know it's much healthier to use the staircase. The use of the staircase uh, uh, was rising by nearly 70%. And there was no sign, the escalator was working as normal, it was just more fun, right? And that's the carrot approach. You know, <coughs> give people something positive, Sienna Miller visiting, or um, uh, uh, music playing with you when you, when you s step onto them, um, uh, and that works as well. Now, <coughs> and pretty much in similar ways, you could say media consumption worked, right? You either use a stick, which is, oh boy, you got to watch the news because otherwise, you know, you, 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 you know bad things will happen. Um, 
very first generation I knew in, in our household it was obligatory to you know switch on the TV at eight o'clock because you must watch the view the news etc etc et um, 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 bad bad thing um, or you know um, uh, the the carrot approach would be you know you have some tremendously good programming I don't know Matt man or something like this and all of a sudden you know people people come and watch and, and, and it's just brilliant the challenge of course is if your screens multiply right um, because um, as, as, as Rob said earlier, you know, then it's, it's whenever, wherever, whatever. Um, it's much, much harder to keep people watching um, that one screen uh, and they walk away, chairs empty. Um, and then, now what? And now I come to gamification, if you want to call it like that. Now, games are, and, and that's why I said Kevin is so much smarter. He, um, um, uh, uh, managed to elaborate so much more uh, with so much more sophistication on this but games basically use fairly ubiquitous mechanics which 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 we know that work right it, it's the the whole bit of challenging others and comparing yourself with others um, high scores there's the gifting idea um, there's the whole pointification idea of of cash etc there is achievements and rewards um, uh, and and um, a lot of a lot of games make use of those features. And what Kevin said earlier is really, really important. This is not a game mechanic. This is the expression of a game mechanic um, or the result of, 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 of it. Um, but that's what games basically do. Now, you probably all know that. Um, uh, uh, if you're really busy checking in today, you'll get that, that mayor crown um, um, on the left. What Foursquare did here is they basically did an overlay of something that is actually quite useful to let your friends know where you are um, uh, uh, and, added, and added one little game design mechanic um, to make it more fun. Now, at the early start of Foursquare, I know people who changed their way to work so they could check in into their favorite pub in the morning because they were competing with a friend who happened to be a corporate partner in a law firm. Um, uh, and they were competing with each other for, for, for becoming mayor in their, in their pub. Um, Kevin mentioned Nike Plus. Um, uh, that is not only about collecting points, I would suggest, because it has this output into Facebook and Twitter. And if you're my age, you know that you need a lot of encouragement um, from your friends to actually do that. And when you, when you, when you have a look at, at, uh, uh, at Facebook, um, where, where people um, um, literally help and support their friends with a view to you know what they've done that is quite tremendous so there's a collaborative element into that as well um, this one is my favorite uh, it's the dashboard of the 2010 Ford Fusion hybrid and it looks like a very fancy dashboard and it's all very very nice but they have this funny plant here um, um, uh, at the right and it's basically a Tamagotchi um, now this plant thrives the more economical you drive if you would apply this to the car fleet in the world um, and everyone would save 5 MPG um, on average, which is probably a little high, but that would save half the Saudi Arabian oil output every year. So, you know, there, there, it is not only fun and games. You can actually trigger um, behavior by, by using very, very simple mechanics. Um, and now I can't click it. It is a game, indeed. I think I just lost. <laughs> um, and then the final, the final example I, that I want to show you, this is Lee Sheldon. He's a, he's a professor, admittedly, for game design, I think in Indianapolis. And what he did, he got rid of grades. So um, you, don't, you don't go from a C to a B anymore, uh, but you level up. You basically earn XP's and you level up. Now, the interesting thing is, again, it was, it, this is not only fun, but um, attendance in his classes um, uh, uh, rose, achievement rose, and attainment rose. Um, so it did actually have an impact on, um, uh, on how people engaged and, 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 and how people behaved. Um, so what is underlying all that, and this is what gamification really is. It, is. it is about augmenting experiences with ubiquitous mechanics that are fun. If you do that, um, then you, you, you have a ton of, um, um, of opportunities here. Now, the important thing to take away for, for broadcasters, for producers, et cetera, is this is a programming 
tool. This is not something where you say, oh, we throw this over the fence, and then we sprinkle some social tools over it, and then it'll all become great. If you have a shit game, it will remain a shit game no matter how much social you do to it, right? And if you have, if you have a programming format that is, that is unidirectional towards the viewer, it will not become this sprawling, beautiful, multi-screen, interactive experience only by adding a couple of tools. It is very, very important that you start looking at these things in a much, much more holistic way. On the other hand, if Ford can apply game mechanic to their freaking product, you guys should, should, uh, uh, should be able to do that um, um, uh, quite easily and probably on a Sunday night. Um, that was all. Thank you. So a question for Kevin then. You started out with uh, kind of rejecting the term. Fair enough. It's an overhyped term, gamification. It's an ugly word. Fair enough. Um, but do you reject the premise of extending game mechanics to other types of experiences? Because I think Fulker just gave us a whole bunch of great examples of successful right. games that have been associated with different kinds of activities. What's your take on that? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, sorry. How about that? Okay, good. Um, uh, no, I think, I think uh, uh, the way that you just said it is exactly right. I think that there are, there are ways to use game mechanics uh, uh, you know, within a variety of experiences. The, the examples that you gave are excellent. The, uh, the, the Ford one is a, is a good example. It's not, it's not that you know, Ford didn't make a game, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, uh, what you're doing in that, wouldn't, you wouldn't call that playing a game. Um, uh, however, they're taking things that game designers and game uh, and the, 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 ga the game designers work with all the time, and applying the lessons of that uh, to fundamentally experience design. Right. Um, and you know, and I think I think it's just that it's it's more about understanding that what 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 game designers have done is produced a sort of uh, bounty of uh, of of understanding about humans uh, that we can all capitalize on in a million different ways. Right. So. Now, Folker, I think you'd probably agree with Kevin's assertion that if you make a, you, know, you said it yourself, if you make a bad game, or if you, just, just any mic, if you pick up both, find the audio. Um, if you make a bad game, of course it's going to be unsuccessful. And if you strip out a couple game mechanics and just slap those randomly onto some sort of experience, that's not really going to be satisfactory. One of the things I've noticed about social media is that what drives interaction in social media, more than anything else, is the desire for recognition. That's why people are posting stuff to Facebook or why they're posting things to Twitter. They definitely want to get followers. They definitely want to be read. They definitely want the acknowledgement. Don't you agree that that is game-like in some fashion? Uh, I, I think it absolutely is. I, I, I did, a, did a talk at a TEDx thing with kids um, a couple of months back. Amazing, I had a slide coming out where, where I threw all sorts of things up, different sports, different TV formats, game shows, X Factor, whatever it was and ask people to stand up whenever something they could identify with was there. Um, um, after 20 seconds and, and 10 words, everyone was standing. Now, what all these things had in common was that they had an underlying competitive element to it, mm -hmm. um, uh, to which everyone can relate. Um, and equally, I think everyone can relate to a collaborative element when it comes in particular to people they care for, um, friends um, uh, uh, in particular. And, and this is exactly what achievements, what high scores, what challenges, um, uh, uh, but also then on the collaborati collaborative side, what virtual gifting, for instance, does. It allows you to express that. But the, 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 the current is already there. People are competitive and people do like collaboration and people do like to help people. Um, uh, uh, so that is something that is not new and that is not invented. Right. It's just the, the um, uh, personification, if you wish, um, uh, is coming through but that. To this day, most of the U.S. cable channels, if you visit their websites, they'll have games that are sort of obligatory game offering, and those typically consist of a bunch of really lame game engines that have been reskinned with the marks and the characters from the television shows, and so it's kind of like a nod in the direction uh, that, that says, yeah, our audience wants to do something interactive because the rest of our site is basically a giant promo for the TV network, and so here, go, in, go amuse yourself in this ghetto called games. That's not much of a game offering. Right. What your companies do is something radically different because you take a TV company, for instance, or any media company, and you actually help them extend their brand into social media in a way that gives people a meaningful engagement, a meaningful role in that experience. Is that a fair summary of what you do? Yeah, quite right. Good. Yeah, um, uh, yeah I mean, I think that what you're, um, uh, what you're, what you're describing as the, as the conventional approach to it. Yeah. Um, 
uh, uh, it's useful sometimes to think about um, uh, one of the ways that game designers approach the world uh, is they talk about MDA, mechanics, dynamics, aesthetics, right? And it's different than the way that like an advertising executive approaches the world. There's the art director and the copywriter. There's how it looks and what it says. But a game designer looks at it and they say, there's the mechanics, which is what, what, are, the, what are the rules of the thing? There are the dynamics, which is what, is the, what are the behaviors that are produced? And what are the aesthetics, which is to say, what does it look like? What's the thing that it's uh, uh, sort of aspiring to, right? Um, and I think the, the convention, the, the, the common misunderstanding is, is that by changing the aesthetics, you change the game, right? And what you see in that ghetto of game land mm -hmm. uh, uh, is usually just twisting the A, right? Like twisting the aesthetic thing. Okay, if you, if you, you know, if it's chess with Simpsons characters, then it has more to do with the Simpsons than chess. And that's not really the way it works. So, so you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a different understanding of it. What, what we're trying to do uh, with Starling is think about, well, what are the mechanics and dynamics that you can apply to broadcast television, to the ways that people are already watching TV, to the ways that they're actually having the conversations around it, and can we apply certain mechanics of, for example, uh, um, uh, we have inventory of cards, in effect, that you're playing uh, as, you're, as you're watching, and we're using things like artificial scarcity, et cetera, um, uh, uh, things that, that play out in games um, uh, of, you know, what does it take to be able to do something? How do you, how do you, uh, 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 what is it, uh, is it, is it, is it, um, does something become more valuable if it's a little bit harder to get? Um, and in this case, it's being able to play uh, the card of your favorite character on Glee or what have you. That rather than giving you everything up front, it's holding something back a little bit, right? Mm. If you can hold something back, uh, which is totally counterintuitive to conventional entertainment uh, in a sense, uh, if you can hold something back as long as possible, it acquires value uh, the further you hold it back. Um, and so, so these are the kinds of things that we're playing with. You know, I would love to continue this conversation because I think it's a fascinating topic. We are out of time and it's time for our coffee break. But what I would like to encourage you all to do is don't go far because ju in just about 15 minutes, we're going to have a fantastic presentation from Facebook on the subject of engaging passionate fans. Let's take a 15 minute break. Thank you, Falker. Thank you, Kevin, for coming over here to do this today. Please continue the discussion with them during the break.